a physical geology class. This is Shorelines Chapter 20. The shorelines of any landscape are a really dynamic landscape. That interface is a boundary where different systems interact, specifically hydrosphere and geosphere. And the coastal zone is an area where it's constantly being modified by waves. And so it's a dynamic, it's a landscape that elevation changes, shoreline shape changes, islands move, okay? The present day shorelines that we see today uh, are affected by uh, interaction between the sea and the local geology. And more humans live near the coast than in the past. So um, a lot of times uh, humans treat the uh, coastal zone as kind of like a stable landscape when in fact it's geodynamic and is capable of, being, capable of being altered by plate tectonics or sea level or crazy storms. Here's an example of some shorelines. This is Cape Cod on the east coast. Um, <clears throat> many of the uh, northern uh, east coast uh, islands and spits and coastal features were shaped in the last uh, glacial maximum. So a lot of the locations here are determined by uh, glacial moraines um, that were left uh, in, in these areas of the uh, continental margin. And on the right is Point Reyes uh, on the west coast in California. And uh, this area is being uh, affected tectonically. Okay, certain areas may be uplifted um, and exposed to the uh, waves in the Pacific Ocean. And then we have um, Major hurricanes. Hurricanes can alter coastlines as well. And uh, we like to build homes near really beautiful places uh, in, in the coastal zone. And they're susceptible to be taken away, damaged, and destroyed because of this, uh, these uh, natural phenomena. So let's go over some basic features of the shoreline. Um, the shoreline is a line that marks the contact between land and sea. The shore extends between the lowest tide level and the highest elevated area affected by storms. So that's beyond the high tide level. And so the coast extends inland uh, from the shore as far as ocean related features are found. And then the coastline marks the uh, seaward edge of the coast. So here we go. This is the low tide shoreline. Okay, so during low tide, uh, that point in the day, um, this is where the shoreline would be. This is in the image, the active shoreline. Here's the high tide line. A lot of times you can see that uh, by washed up debris, maybe some algae and stuff like that. Uh, then sometimes there's a little ridge here we refer to as the berm. Okay, and this is the recreational beach area. This would be the coastline. And in a lot of places, uh, there are dunes behind, or yeah, behind the coastline. Okay. Um, this area here is the back shore from the high tide line to the coastline. The foreshore is from the high tide line to the low tide line. And when we talk about the shore, that's this whole area. Um, and then this is the near shore. Okay. And then once you go off behind, um, uh, past the um, increasing elevation of the shore, that's the top shore. So here are those subdivisions we just talked about, okay? Foreshore, backshore, the near shore, which is low tide line to where the waves break at low tide. Um, and then offshore is beyond where the waves break. Okay, the waves break because of that uh, changing seafloor elevation. All right, so that's over here. All right, beaches, that's where you get an accumulation of sediment. And that's found along the kind of margin uh, of any, any landward margin of ocean or lake. And beaches are composed of maybe one or more berms. Those are relatively flat areas composed of sand. That's kind of like the recreational beach. And then the beach face is that 
wet sloping surface that extends from the berm to the shoreline. This is like, uh, say you kick off your shoes and you're going into the water and you just want the water or the waves to just like crash and then that rush of swash water comes up the beach face and then your feet start sinking in the sand. That's the beach face. A lot of runners like to run on the beach face because that's where the most compacted sand is. And the beach sand itself is just composed of whatever is locally abundant. Um, this is derived from erosion of nearby cliffs or rocks. An example like the mountains. Uh, so here are two examples. This is uh, on Sanibel Island in Florida. The locally available material are the shells of marine organisms. I don't know if you've been there, but yeah, it's tough. It's difficult to walk around barefoot there, right? It's like you're stepping on a bunch of Lego pieces. Ah, ah, ah. So that's Sanibel Beach. Also like in Sarasota, Lido Keys, a lot like this. Uh, but most of the beaches in Florida, or a lot of the beaches in Florida, have either white or beige sand. That's quartz. Quartz that is kind of uh, eroding from the Appalachian Mountains just north of us. The longshore currents kind of move southward and bring a lot of sand that's eroding from uh, the Appalachian, the rocks exposed from the Appalachian Mountains. In other per parts of the world, uh, I don't know if you've been, uh, but this, this is Hawaii. Um, the locally abundant material is basalt, right? Volcanic rock. Um, and when that breaks down, that becomes black sand. You can find black sand in uh, places in Central America because uh, there are a lot of volcanics uh, near the coastline there. Um, and black sand gets really hot when the sun's out. <laughs> Just a, a warning. But it's, it's, it's very nice. Hawaii also has um, areas with green sand beaches, um, and that's because of uh, the mantle xenoliths that come up to the surface and erode away, and that's essentially that sand is made of olivine and pyroxene, which is pretty, pretty amazing. All right, let's talk about the waves moving through the oceans. The waves travel along the ocean atmosphere interface, and essentially um, they're pushed by uh, atmospheric circulation. Um, the waves themselves, or the, you know, the water, they're visible ed evidence of just energy passing through a medium. And like when a wave is traveling through the ocean, it's just energy traveling through a material, and that material is water. Um, the water doesn't travel along with the wave itself. It just, the, the energy is what travels through um, uh, the water. So uh, it's kind of like, think of yourself as, um, like say you're on a surfboard in the ocean and you're just bobbing up and down and waves are passing underneath you. You're like one of those water molecules, right? And so when a wave passes underneath you, you bob up and then up, bob back down and then the wave passes you. So that's just the energy that's transferred from uh, wind. Wind uh, kind of blows along the surface of the ocean, okay? Starts off really small, it's like tiny little waves. Imagine blowing over, uh, over uh, a hot coffee and watching the ripples form. So on a large scale, the wind kind of transfers its energy. Only about 2% of the energy is transferred directly to the water, and that's what generates wind induced waves. Okay, so um, let's talk about the components of non-breaking waves. So the crest is the top of the wave, the trough is the bottom, the wave height is the vertical distance between crest and trough, and the wavelength is the horizontal distance between two successive wave crests or troughs. And the period is the time it takes for one full wavelength to pass. Okay, so if we look at, oh, I think the next slide is an image, but I don't want to move there quite yet. Okay, so some wave characteristics. The height, length, and period of a wave depend on the wind speed, the length of time that the wind has blown, and also the distance that the wind has traveled across open water. We call that fetch. Okay, so waves can travel really long distances in the open ocean. And the water itself doesn't move. It just waves just uh, essentially pass the energy along to the next water molecule. And this motion is kind of a circular orbital motion. Okay, so back to, this is the crest of a wave, okay? Here's the trough. The height difference from the trough to the crest, that's the wave height. The wavelength is from wave crest to wave 
crest or trough to trough. They're about the same, okay? Uh, this dotted line here is the still water level. So imagine there was no energy passing through uh, the water itself. That's where it'd be laying naturally. Okay, let's pretend the wave movement is in this direction. And so the water molecules move in this orbital fashion, okay? So as a wave passes through it, water molecules will kind of uh, turn downward and uh, move in this direction, okay, in this kind of clockwise direction. And that itself pushes water molecules below at depth in the same kind of orbital motion. But these circles get smaller because the energy is kind of dissipated and uh, decreases as you go deeper. And then right around this level here, there's negligible water movement. And that is actually measurable. It's one half the wavelength of the wave. So if you go from crest to trough, and then that distance downwards, that's the called the wave base. And here is the example of uh, uh, you in a bathtub with a toy, toy boat making your own waves. Okay, the toy boat won't follow the wave with it; it'll just bob up and down. And if you chart its path, it's one of those uh, orbital paths that the water molecules take as the wave kind of passes through it. All right, let's talk about how waves, that's, you know, the, what we talked about is waves in the open ocean. How, how do waves change as we approach uh, the coastal areas, okay? So deep water waves are unaffected by the uh, water depth in the open ocean because um, the water depth is so deep, so they don't feel the, the shore or the sea floor. So when the wave base of a wave approaches kind of shoaling, a shoaling area where the shoreline or the uh, seafloor is uh, kind of uh, coming up, um, then uh, this changes the behavior of the wave. So the wave, feel, quote unquote, feels the bottom, okay? So the seafloor interferes with the orbital uh, movement of the water and start to slow down the wave, okay? Um, and so as the waves, what happens is the waves uh, the orbital paths flatten, and then the uh, water at the bottom uh, uh, starts slowing down, and the water uh, above the wave starts speeding up, so the wave starts to tilt forward. And then um, the wave height increases because um, now you're in a, a smaller water column, and then the wave begins to break. And that's where you get surf. That's that turbulent water breaking waves. So here it is. Here's the wave base, okay? Um, it, the wave itself is interacting or moving molecules of water in this entire water column. So as the wave is approaching shallower water, now the wave base, quote unquote, feels the bottom, okay? And so what happens here is that this uh, bottom half of the wave kind of slows down, and then the top half, the orbitals start kind of uh, um, turning into ellipses and start flattening out and it starts leaning forward, okay? Um, and as it leans forward, then you start forming breakers and then the waves break and then you're used to that, right? And this is constant. When you go to sleep tonight, there's gonna be waves breaking on the beach in Daytona, Melbourne, Clearwater, Miami Beach, Fort Lauderdale Beach, all those places, Sarasota, Sanibel Island. This happens every day. When you wake up, it's gonna be happening after you have breakfast, <laughs> waves are crashing on the ocean. And so that consistent energy causes wave erosion and, and it, it's a lot of energy, okay? The Atlantic winter waves average about 10,000 uh, um, kilograms per meter squared of wave erosion, okay? And then so when there are actual storms, it's greater than that, okay? There's abrasion, that's when the, that's the grinding action of water with rock fragments. And it's very intense in the surf zone. If you notice, a lot of times when you get into the uh, breaking waters, uh, there'll be a lot of sand in suspension. And then when the waves break, that sand just slams down onto the beach face where there's other sand and that's where that abrasion occurs. Okay, here's an example of some mega surf uh, large waves hitting storm waves, hitting a, uh, an enforced coastline here. So that abrasion, what 
that does, um, we don't see beaches like this in Florida um, in a lot of other places. We're really blessed with amazing uh, uh, sand beaches here, but sometimes uh, you have rocky coastlines. And so that abrasion, what that does, if you've ever seen this, it's rounded off a lot of these uh, rock fragments, these pebbles, boulders, and, and uh, pieces of gravel. Okay, that's from uh, constant wave action. And then here, this is a sandstone cliff in British Columbia, and the waves have <laughs> undercut this. You can even see areas where there's a tree roots kind of growing into the sandstone, but the waves have eroded all of this material out. So they do a lot of work. All right, sand moves along the beach, okay? Uh, there's a lot of sand movement. You probably have witnessed this if you've got, uh, you know, sand in your bathing suit and all these weird places when you get hit by a wave. That's because there's a lot of sand in suspension in the water. Whenever you have fast-moving water, it will keep sand in suspension. And on a beach in particular, there's swash and backwash, okay? Swash is when you have an incoming wave crashing on the beach face, and backwash is that kind of, like, pulling force that the water like comes back into the ocean, okay? Um, so uh, there's uh, a net gain or net loss of sand, and that depends on the level of wave activity. So in the summertime, I don't know if you've, this is typical in the summertime, there's light wave action. So what that means is that the berm itself widens, meaning more sand is deposited on the beach because the swash or incoming uh, uh, wave energy brings more sand towards the beach. Uh, in the wintertime, typically, uh, they, there are more powerful storms and stronger wave activities, so then the uh, backwash dominates, and that erodes the berm, and so you have smaller uh, beaches during the winter. Um, and so sand moves or is transported along the beach and it, the direction is um, kind of like parallel to the coastline. So say you have the coastline, you can have sand moving in this direction or a longshore current moving in that direction. So it's kind of uh, the net direction of sand can either go either way. And that's, that's based on the angle of incoming waves. And uh, the reason for this is because waves refract. That's just when uh, waves begin to bend. So as uh, waves approach a shore, say you have a shoreline here, and say you have incoming waves that are coming in at an angle like this, okay? Um, this portion of the wave will touch or feel the seafloor first, so then the, the wave itself stops turning and starts facing the shoreline, even though the waves may have been kind of traveling in that general direction. Um, and it's because of that wave refraction. Like if you're standing on the beach here, um, yay, right? Um, the, the waves are always crashing right in front of you. You never see like a sideways crashing wave like away from you. Um, that's very odd, and that's because of wave refraction. So because waves refract, that means that the energy of waves is concentrated in areas of the coast called the headlands, and that the, the water velocity weaken, or decreases and the energy weakens at bays. So what this does over time is it straightens the regular shorelines. So here, for example, this is a headland. It's like a, an area of land that sticks out, okay? And so the waves are refracting towards the headland. So the majority of the wave energy, see how these waves are kind of bending towards the headland? So the majority of the wave action is focused here, and that causes a lot of erosion. Um, and then the wave energy dissipates in these areas, and this is where you see deposition, and this is where you would see sand, so people would be hanging out here. Okay, here, this illustrates the wave refraction. Okay, if you notice, if you're standing here, the waves are crashing right in front of you, despite the fact that the incoming waves are moving in this direction initially. But what happens is, as they approach here, they start touching the sea floor, and the waves begin to bend and refract, and then the, the wave itself turns and then crashes straight on uh, facing me over here. We call that uh, wave refraction. Um, the sand movement along the beach is called the longshore current or longshore transport. So uh, it's also called the beach drift or literal drift. And it's a zigzag motion of the sand along the beach. Okay, 
I know this has probably happened to you. Um, ever gone to the beach and gone into the water and then just didn't really pay attention, throwing the football around or swimming, wrestling or whatever. And all of a sudden you turn around and look back to where your camp is with all your stuff and you're like 40 feet or 50 or like 100 yards away because the current's been kind of pushing you around or you're drifting along a current. That's the longshore current. Okay. So beaches can be characterized as rivers of sand that uh, these rivers move along these longshore currents that you can be carried on. Okay, so here's an example of a longshore current, okay? And with every crashing wave, here's the swash, backwash, swash, and it's a zigzag pattern. And so the net transport of the sand is along this direction. So that's the general direction where the sand is moving, okay? And you can predict the direction of the longshore current based on the angle of the waves that are coming in. Okay. Um, rip currents can form on the beach and these are really dangerous. Um, <clears throat> in some cases, uh, rip currents are concentrated on areas where the backwash is on the ocean surface. And you can uh, recognize uh, rip currents because there's no crashing waves here. And that's because the superficial water is moving back out to the ocean. Okay, so uh, lifeguards know this. A lot of times if there are lifeguards on the beach or if there aren't any lifeguards, then if you see this, make sure you don't swim in this area because you could get pulled out. Some, sometimes they're pretty strong currents. They can pull you out. And, the, uh, you know, what you got to do is not panic. Um, let it take you out and then swim back over on this side or just swim parallel to the coast and then swim back. Um, a lot of people will panic and start to fight the current and then tire themselves out, and this can uh, lead to drowning, which is uh, a terrible way to go. All right, so let's talk about some of the shoreline features. Um, and uh, the features on a shoreline depend on a lot of factors, how close you are to rivers depositing a lot of sediment, if there's any tectonic activity, the uh, geology and topology of the land, the prevailing wind and weather patterns, and the configuration of the coastline. These are all factors. Um, but if we look at uh, some shoreline features, there are erosional features. Um, these are wave cut cliffs, wave cut platforms, I've got pictures, don't worry, and marine terraces, okay? Wave cut cliffs, they originate um, by the cutting action of the surf against the base of the coast. So it kind of um, uh, uh, cuts these uh, like uh, s steeply sloping cliffs. Platforms are benched like flat surfaces that are left behind by a receding cliff. And this typically occurs, these erosional features occur in areas that uh, have been tectonically uplifted um, and they can create a marine terror. Let me show you a picture. So this is a marine terrace. It was formerly a wave cut platform. See this flat area over here, but it was tectonically uplifted to its current position. And so that's why um, tectonics plays a, a major role in, in uh, shoreline dynamics. And then here's the wave cut cliffs here. You see these slopes here? So you typically see these type of uh, shorelines on the west coast of the United States where it's active tech, uh, tectonics. Um, other erosional features you may run into in these type of coastlines are sea arches and sea stacks. These are headlands and they receive the brunt of the wave energy, especially during storms. And the rocks in the headlands, they, they don't erode at the same rate. So what you create are uh, these really cool features here. This is a sea arch, okay. Um, in some places you can kind of boat through them or kayak which is pretty cool. Um, and then this is a sea stack. This is almost like a little island by itself out on the coastline. Sea stacks used to be sea arches, so this may have been connected over here, uh, but since then the arches collapsed and eroded away, leaving behind this stump of a sea stack. I don't know why I said it like that. All right, there are different types of coastlines. This is more typical of the Atlantic coast, depositional features, spitz bars and tumbleos. A spit is like a, an elongated ridge of sand that extends from uh, land and into uh, the mouth of a bay, okay? 
A bay, mar bay mouth bar is just a long, almost like a barrier island, but it kind of cuts off a bay. And a tumbelo is a ridge of sand that connects an island to uh, the mainland. I got pictures, don't worry. So here's a spit, all right? So here's that ridge of sand that curls into um, a bay. So the bay would be right here, maybe there's a better picture. Um, so ocean water is coming into this estuary here. Um, you can, you can uh, by the shape of a spit, you can determine the longshore current as uh, moving in this direction because the net transport of sand is here and then it gets deposited out in this kind of hook shape. Here's another spit. And so here you can determine longshore current is moving in this direction. And then this is a bay mouth bar. So this is a bar of sand essentially that cuts an entire bay off and kind of creates a lagoon. Sometimes you can have inlets. Okay, that's a bay mouth bar. Okay, barrier islands, these are low ridges of sand that are parallel to the coast and they typically are three to 30 kilometers offshore. Um, they're mainly found on the Atlantic coast and the Gulf coastal plain. Um, some are either one to five kilometers wide, some are, uh, and they're about 15 to 30 kilometers long. Cape Canaveral is a perfect example of a barrier island. Further south, I mean, well, Clearwater barrier island, okay. Um, uh, if you go down, some Miami Beach is on a barrier island. And they may have formed in several waves, uh, ways. Some originate as spits, those depositional features, just sand piling up in an area. Um, some just originate as sand piled up offshore that erodes from uh, um, uh, different areas, maybe off of uh, rivers that dump out into the ocean. And some are flooded sand dunes from the last glacial period. Okay, so here's an example, usually very narrow ridges of sand here. Okay, this is uh, uh, an image of the Outer Banks. All right. So here, the Outer Banks is part of North Carolina, this narrow ridge of islands all here. And there's a kink in it, that's where Hatteras Point is. And then this goes further north. Okay, so this is uh, the entire, essentially this is the North Carolina coastline and then the Bear Islands are just beyond that. Great vacation spot, uh, very beautiful islands, uh, really well developed uh, over here. Um, and then there's massive sand dunes uh, on these barrier islands here. That's where the Wright brothers tested out uh, some of their uh, early models because of the uh, kind of constant uh, um, sea breeze that would blow there so that they could get a lot of lift for their early models of planes. Okay, emerging coasts, uh, that's how we classify some of the coastlines. Um, emerging coasts are ones that develop because of uplift or a drop in sea level. So Hudson Bay or the California coast are good examples of this. And they're the ones that have those erosional features like wave cut cliffs, uh, platforms, and marine terraces. Okay, submerging coast, this is more like the east coast of the United States. This is caused by either subsidence of land or sea level rise. So the entire Atlantic coast are an example of this. Okay, and so what you see on a submerging coastline, you'll find drowned river mouths, or we call them uh, estuaries, okay? And uh, we have, you know, bay mouth bars, barrier islands, spits, lagoons, stuff like that. So here's a, an example of an East Coast uh, estuary. Okay, so this is the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, here's the Susquehanna River dumping into the Chesapeake. Okay, and then, um, yeah, so this, is, this would be uh, an East Coast estuary. You get a lot of these, uh, what are they, blue crabs is what's big here. Um, but uh, we're currently in an interglacial period, so sea level is rising. Um, this whole area is the continent, right? This is the, the continental margin. Um, when when uh, times are colder in glacial periods, sea level falls. And then this whole area becomes a valley. So these are river valleys. So 18,000 years ago, these were valleys that, you know, I'm sure a lot of animals were herding across these valleys in that time. Uh, but now they're drowned by the ocean, and so now they're estuaries. Okay, this is uh, on Cape Hatteras. Uh, this is the lighthouse. The lighthouse had to be moved about 2,900 feet because of constant um, uh, beach erosion. There was in, it was in, being endangered of losing the famous uh, lighthouse here. Um, 
uh, because of, uh, of beach erosion. And this is an important lighthouse. Cape Hatteras is at that kink. Remember, uh, this is the the the, um, the uh, barrier islands off the coast of North Carolina, the Outer Banks. It's at this kink right here, and this is where the Gulf Stream meets kind of uh, an, uh, northern cold waters that run into each other. So there are a lot of uh, shipwrecks and stuff like this. So it's very useful to have um, a lighthouse here to warn boats. Okay, so the Americas coasts are uh, they contrast a lot. Atlantic and Gulf Coast, um, you have a lot of the uh, development on barrier islands, which is not really a great idea because those are the areas that receive the brunt of coastal storms. On the Pacific Coast, their biggest problems are the beaches are getting smaller and smaller. And the reason is because out west, it's a lot drier, so they use more surficial water. And so what they do is they dam up a lot of the rivers to create reservoirs, and they use the reservoirs to store water, and that's what they use. Um, but if you dam up rivers, that uh, holds up the sediment from reaching the coast, so a lot of the beaches have thinned, and there's a lot of beach starvation. Um, and then the beaches can't protect the cliffs, and then you get a lot of uh, mass wasting on those cliffs, and those houses start to fall into the ocean. So there's a lot of erosion uh, issues on the Pacific coast. Okay, so here's that Pacific coastline. Where am I supposed to set my blanket down? There's no beaches. But, I mean, very beautiful though. All right, hurricanes. I'm sure you guys are very familiar with these. Hurricanes are the greatest storms on Earth. Uh, they're called typhoons in the Western Pacific and cyclones in the Indian Ocean, but they're the same thing. They're just low pressure systems. Um, they're some of the most destructive natural disasters that occur every year uh, during our hurricane season in the North, northern hemisphere. Um, over 50% of the U.S. population lives within 75 kilometers of the coast, so all these people are at risk. We have to deal with every hurricane season. Okay, so here's a hurricane. Here's the uh, eye of the storm, okay? And most of the highest winds and heavy precipitation occurs uh, right along the eye wall. Okay. Um, let's take a look at a profile of a hurricane. Hurricanes um, tend to form in the late summer and early fall. That's when uh, sea surface temperature are the warmest. Um, and they must reach, sea surface temperatures must reach about 27 degrees Celsius to provide enough heat and moisture for the storm. So what really powers a hurricane is the heat released from condensation. So what happens is you have a low pressure system form and that makes uh, kind of air masses move towards it. And as air masses move towards it, if they, if they have uh, a lot of moisture in them, uh, that vapor or water vapor will condense to form a liquid and form, you know, like a cloud and form a liquid within that cloud and that releases heat and that causes air to rise if enough heat is released, right? So then that continually happens and the storm intensifies. Okay, um, so here, this is um, hurricanes occur in the northern hemisphere for us. Uh, this is the total number of hurricanes and tropical storms right after uh, kind of first week in September. Okay, um, so this is our peak of the season. Um, our season starts, uh, what is it, June 15th or something? This is when our season kind of starts. Um, and then it ends uh, mid-November. But the peak is definitely right here. September, or I'm sorry, August to uh, November is, oh God, I just confused everybody. This is the time when we have to watch out for hurricanes. So we watch the Atlantic Ocean Basin. And this is where they typically form off the coast of Africa. We got really warm tropical waters here. Um, this is where those low pressure, pressure systems form and then they run their paths. A lot of times they and move up and curve or go into the Caribbean. Okay, so this is the area where they form really warm water. That's what kind of fuels these storms. Okay, so I outlined that. This is August to October is peak time for hurricanes form, forming in the Atlantic Ocean Basin. Um, in the Pacific, we have hurricanes form here, but no one cares too much about these because a lot of times they just go out into the middle of the Pacific Ocean and don't affect anybody. Occasionally, they come back and hit Mexico uh, which can be a problem, or Central America. Um, but here, Australia deals with 
uh, hurricanes from January to March. They're in the southern hemisphere, so this is when uh, this portion of the uh, eastern South Pacific heats up. Here's the Indian Ocean. Uh, they deal with a January to March uh, peak season here. And then in the northern hemisphere, Japan deals with these typhoons in Southeast Asia. Um, actually, the, the, the most uh, uh, typhoon or hurricanes or typhoons, low pressure storms form in, in this part of the uh, Western Pacific. So let's look at a profile of a hurricane. They're intense low pressure centers, and so this, the center of the storm is um, uh, very low in pressure, so a lot of wind moves towards it. Um, and as you move towards the center of the storm, the pressure decreases, okay? And the steep pressure gradients results in stronger wind force, okay? So the way the storm structure work, works as warm air and moist air approaches the core, the air rises along a ring of cumulonimbus clouds. Um, and this wall of rising air is called the eye wall, okay? That has the greatest wind speeds and the heaviest rain. Um, the center of the storm, as you know, is called the eye. And precipitation and wind speed completely stop in the eye of a hurricane. Um, I was in Fort Lauderdale when Hurricane Katrina as a Category 1 kind of moved across the state of Florida. And um, the eye uh, went really out. We were within the eye, which was bizarre because... There are no clouds. You can kind of just look up and it's sunny skies. There's no wind. It's almost like a, a calm before you get hit by the next side of the eye wall. Okay, and so near the top of the hurricane, the airflow is outward. So here it is. You see this is spiraling air. It moves in, moves in a counterclockwise direction as surface winds move toward it. Then they spiral upwards and go aloft. And right at the eye, you have sinking warmer air. Okay, and then there's no cloud cover here but this is where the eye wall is, okay? Um, here's a profile um, as a hurricane's passing through an area. Here's the pressure, right? And the pressure drops to its lowest point right at the eye of the storm. And then here's the actual wind speed. And so as the storm approaches, the highest wind speeds are right at the edge of the eye. So that's the eye wall. And then they, the wind speeds drop drastically to a really big low at the eye wall, at the, um, the center of the storm. And then as the storm passes you, this is the other side of the eye wall. And if you notice, so one eye wall has higher wind speeds than another. Um, so the back end of the storm has uh, slower wind speeds there. So there's a more dangerous portion um, of a hurricane. It's kind of like the uh, Northwestern quadrant is the most dangerous, highest wind speed heaviest precipitation. Okay, so the destruction of a hurricane really depends on a number of factors. One is the size and population density in the area that the storm hits, the shape of the ocean bottom near the shore, because flooding can also be a huge thing. Uh, hurricanes cause a lot of storm surge, um, which means they raise sea level locally. As much as 18 feet increase in sea level uh, during a Category 5 storm. And the categories are based on the Saffir Simpson hurricane scale, okay? As an example, Hurricane Katrina was a category four that struck uh, just east of New Orleans. And Camille in 1969 was a category five. Okay, so here are the, the, the categories one through five, okay? Five has wind speeds over 250 kilometers an hour or greater than 155 sustained winds. Okay, um, and the storm surge over 18 feet. So these are catastrophic storms. So uh, I mentioned the storm surge. That's the most damaging part of a hurricane in the coastal zone. So in the coastal zone, meaning like where there are barrier islands and stuff like that, that is a large dome of water that can make landfall and flood areas. And you get tremendous wave activity uh, because of this. So uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, the storm surge is more intense on the right side of the eye, and that's where the winds are blowing strongest on the shore. The left side, the winds blow away from the shore. So um, this is some of the destruction 
that can occur as a result of a hurricane. Absolute, these are, this is a coastal area. This is, or was the beach. Uh, these were beachfront properties. I don't know how they survived. Maybe they got lucky or their home was built very, very well. It's kind of like that story when Michael hit that panhandle. It's one house on Mexico Beach that survived. Um, the wind damage, that's the most obvious type of damage. Uh, it effect, affects a much larger area than the storm surge. Storm surge really localized in, on the coast. Um, and the hurricanes will occasionally produce tornadoes, like as if it can't get any more cataclysmic than a hurricane, but you get uh, strong tornadoes that can rip through an area. And those heavy rains uh, that move inland can cause inland flooding. And that was the case uh, with Hurricane uh, Floyd in 1999, Hurricane Camille in 1969, uh, a lot of deaths due to flooding in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. They have a lot of uh, high elevations and uh, dynamic topology that diverts a lot of water in areas. Um, a, a more recent hurricane that comes to mind is Harvey that hit Houston. You can YouTube all kinds of crazy flooding that occurred because of the, what was it, like 46 inches of rain in a matter of like four days in Houston, that was devastating. And uh, with global warming, these storms are, um, we're, we're not getting more storms per year, but the storms are getting larger. And uh, meaning like Hurricane Harvey is an example. These storms can hold so much more water because they're, be they're becoming bigger because the oceans are warming and that's what fuels the storms. And uh, we also have a higher risk of uh, higher or more, um, higher intensity storms because of warmer oceans and warmer atmospheres. Okay, so here, this is the, I'm sorry, the northeastern quadrant is the, is the quadrant that you have to be uh, weary of um, because this has the uh, highest wind and the most storm surge. It has to do with that kind of uh, the circulation here. Um, and then if this quadrant hits you, you can consider yourself lucky. So for us in central Florida, a lot of times the um, the hurricanes kind of come up here and curve in this way. That's uh, a decent, uh, that's a nice thing. Uh, uh, like a, a Charlie that kind of cut across the center of the state, then this part of the storm hit us on the right side. Kind of like Irma did, even though Irma was kind of um, a little bit offshore and was only, what, a Category 2. Uh, but those, the ones that come in from the Gulf could be more damaging to central Florida as a result. So how do we detect and track hurricanes? Prior to weather satellites, uh, good luck, bud. <laughs> um, there were very few storm warnings given. And one really sad example was in Galveston, Texas, which is a barrier island off the coast of mainland Texas. In the year 1900, there was a, uh, a, a hurricane that struck. And nobody, and no one there had, you know, they were in paradise. There was no warning. The only thing that um, could precede a hurricane like that is maybe there was uh, a massive um, uh, swell right before the storm, but that could have been any type of storm, so no one really left or evacuated, and um, 8,000 people were killed. This was before satellites, so uh, yeah, it's, it's good growing up in modern times so that you wouldn't have to deal with this. This is what uh, people in Galveston, they, had, they were just completely toppled over by a hurricane that just showed up one day. Today we've got the the eye of uncertainty, you know, and we can, we've got at least four or five days where we can decide whether we want to evacuate or not and prepare for it. So satellites have been a great uh, way of detecting and tracking hurricanes with the spaghetti models and all that. Um, by the way, the European model is like the one that's always most accurate. So whenever they show you the spaghetti models, always kind of focus on the European one. That's the one that was the, that's most accurate. Okay. So so that um, satellites can monitor vast areas of the open ocean where we can see these low pressure systems. Um, then there's aircraft reconnaissance. We fly planes directly into hurricanes to measure the pressure and the wind speed and all that. That helps us determine how strong uh, the hurricane is. Um, we have a, an agency, NOAA, that does this. They fly reconnaissance plane all, all the time. Um, and then there's radar, okay. So here's uh, these uh, areas here. Uh, this is kind of a cross section of a storm, which is pretty cool. And this can tell us the rain rate. Here are the different, you can see that they're like bands of rain every so often. 
uh, where you get heavy rainfall, then lighter rainfall, then heavy rainfall, and it kind of just spirals back. Okay. Oh, and then this is the height. So yeah, these are huge walls of flying water and uplifted ocean. High wind speeds coming at you. Okay, so those are hurricanes. So how do we deal with this crazy ocean throwing storms at us? Well, uh, humans will stabilize the shoreline. Okay, um, during the past hundred years, there's been a lot of increased development in coastal areas because we want to live by the beach. We don't want just that desktop picture of a tropical island. We want to be on that island and on that beach. So what uh, we do to protect those coastlines is hard stabilization. These are structures built to protect the coast from erosion. One example are jetties. These are built perpendicular to the shoreline and extend into the ocean. Um, they can also be found near mouths and rivers and inlets of harbors. Um, they usually do that to maintain inlets and harbors, and it, what it does, one of the consequences is it acts like a dam to the longshore. So here, look, here's a jetty that uh, kind of protects an inlet so boats can go in and out, right, in and out. Um, and here's the direction of the longshore current. So what happens is, um, remember the net sand movement is in this direction. Uh, so what happens is that uh, the water carrying that sand uh, its velocity slows down because it runs into a wall. And when the velocity of water slows down, then it dumps a lot of sediment. So here, the beach used to look like this, right? But then because of the jetty, all of a sudden, all this entire area is new sediment depositing here. So the beach has ex expanded. Great news for the people living here, but bad news for the people living here. Their beach once kind of went out this way, and because this sand is not making it to this side, the longshore current just erodes sand away from here and their beaches diminish. Okay, so these hard stabilization structures don't put any sand on the beach. They just kind of create winners and losers. Okay, and here's a, an aerial shot of this beach that is heavily expanded because of the jetty and then a beach that has diminished on the other side. So you can tell the longshore current is moving in that direction. Then there are groins. Groins are just built perpendicular to the beach, much like jetties, but it's not uh, like protection for an inlet. They just do it right on the beach. And so what happens is that they're built to widen the beaches, but really it just widens one sand side of the beach, like I was talking about before. Here's a groin, here's a groin. And so you see an increased amount of sediment here, but then you see uh, erosion over here. So really you're just creating winners and losers. You're not adding any sand to the beach, okay? Just one area has more sand and one area loses more sand, essentially. Um, then there are also breakwaters and seawalls. These are built parallel to the shore, and they're built a little bit offshore to protect uh, boats that might be kind of uh, like uh, anchored just offshore. And so what that does is that creates sand accumulation directly behind the breakwater. So here, this is Santa Monica Beach in California. Here's the breakwater. So there's a huge breakwater here. People park their boats or anchor their, their boats right over here. And the longshore current's moving in this direction. And as the current moves here, it loses energy and then deposits a whole lot of sand right here. Okay? So these guys are the big winners. Now their beach has expanded. Yeah, Venice Beach. Let's go work out, right? But um, then over here you see increased erosion because that sand's not making it over here. Um, so again, you're not really adding any sand to the beach. All right, so just some consequences, some drawbacks of hard stabilization features. And then seawalls here, this is just uh, a giant seawall here just to protect some of the homes that are here. Seawalls actually do a, a, a really bad job of protecting the actual beach if there's a beach here because it accelerates the erosion of sand on the beach because like the wave energy now is, instead of being focused, on kind of altering the landscape and eroding the landscape now just erodes all the sand away. So there are alternatives to hard stabilization, okay? Um, we do this here in Florida a lot. Uh, we call this beach nourishment, and this involves adding large quantities of sand to the beach. It's very costly, but in Florida, we pass a lot of um, tourist taxes to help pay for this. So it's typically millions of dollars per square mile. Um, all the sand you see on Miami Beach, if you ever go to South Beach, South Beach, right? 
that sand is just dredged up offshore from the longshore uh, bars and deposited on the beach to widen it. Uh, this happens all the time because the ocean just erodes that stuff away and then we just have to put it back on the beach. Okay. Another type of alternative to hard stabilization is relocation. And that's kind of like uh, I showed you that uh, lighthouse in, uh, on Cape Hatteras. Okay, so here's an example. You have a boat, it dredges up sand off a longshore bar here, runs some tubing, and blah, 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 all this sand comes out, and then you can Jersey Shore it up. Have good times on the beach. What are these guys doing? Getting paid and watch sand be deposited. So yeah, that's how we restore our beaches. It's happened a lot on Miami Beach. It happens on our uh, on our coastline, Daytona Beach, and um, uh, Melbourne Beach has a few of these beach renourishment projects.